Okay, I don't know how this is gonna work because I've got one very naughty looking Ridgeback and another one who is very inclined to squeak if he's not being attended to at every second. But nonetheless, lovely assistant. There we go. And now we're going to do next chapter in The Woman Who Wove the World. Exactly, oh, naughty dog. <coughs> exactly one year after I recorded the first chapter. This is not going to be easy. Okay, Gangi, will you please let us actually record the video? Will you? Okay, let's see. We're going to try. Okay, and here we go. The Woman Who Wove the World, Chapter 3. The night of the forest pressed in upon Eruin, who walked through the corridors of trees for what seemed an age. Hoots of owls and howls of wolves pricked the canopy of trees, yet Eruin walked on without fear. After some time, and even some distance, a light began to call to her from a bit of the forest. Suddenly, she saw some of the leaf litter exalted to silver and looked above to finally see the reason for the light. A moon man stood square in her path, the gentle flow of innumerable galaxies swimming about his cloak of light. Yet he was open rather than frightening, and he drew her attention to those inner vaults of himself which so few ever seem willing to share. You were well met, he said. Likewise, said she. Our woods do not frighten you, said the figure. No, replied Eluin, though I'd like to know where I'm going. You were there, the figure said, indicating part of the forest far behind her. And now you're here. That gives a clue. She found him strange, as in funny more than strange, as in peculiar, though that he certainly was too. And now, he said, as if getting to business at last, it is time for you to find the moon. Uh, oh, no, she began. For me, it wasn't a moon, and I found it already. Of course I know that, he laughed. But if you had not found it, how could you begin to help him find his? And suddenly, in the clearing, stood the fossil forest musician. Tell her, said the moon man, tell her some of your story and that of your town. Without so much as a hello, the musician began his story. Well, you see, once we had the moon, but now we don't. A slightly confused pause followed. And? Eluin asked. Well, the moon was my everything. Many people's everything. With it, I'd turn a dark clearing like this, not only sylvan, but silver. I'd use her beams like strings to play songs and tell stories that would lift people's spirits like birds. It would allow them to leave their troublesome thoughts hooked on branches and twigs, where soon they'd disintegrate to become nothing more than extra stardust, and the people could break out and fly free. But she's gone, your moon, Eluin said. Not just his, Moon Man said. Moon to many. And the town grows dead and proud by the day for her lacking. And it is for you two to find it, he declared. You will journey together on a vessel I shall provide in search of the moon. Suddenly, they were in a strange amphibious boat gliding down the canals formed by the ancient forest. Yet, Moonman's voice continued above them. You shall find where to go. You shall feel where to go. Sometimes you'll even catch a glimpse of the moon you follow, but always you shall know the direction 
follow on, wherever that may be. And they did. For what seemed an age, they dissected the ancient Venetian forest, the sounds of her waters both lulling them to sleep and waking them with each small wave. Once on land, the vehicle transformed, a never-ending hall somehow driving along, yet surprisingly, with the musician cheerfully chatting as acting as the driver, and Aelwyn playing music to buoy up their spirits. You'll find it does you maybe the most good of all to play, he chatted. The time just whooshes by, and the space. His slightly manic manner could have been unsettling, but it wasn't. Rather, Eluin played on, laughing and happy in the shade of his jocularity. The two passed time that way for half of forever, and soon grew fond and close enough, even for silence. When the forest floor gave way to water, and when the trees gave way to canyons, they once more floated on a ship that sailed unfailingly to where she knew she needed to be. And they would swim beside her, clothing shed, egos abandoned also. The two could pass hours playing and searching beneath the waters without a care or fear, as if they had somehow found the moon already. When suddenly they were apart, Aelwyn clinking through the forest without her cheerful companion, only the shadow of her thoughts, fainter than mist, shared the ride, and they, in gusts, pushed the vehicle onward irrevocably. Meanwhile, the musician found himself alone and drifting on a sail of bark to the edge of the forest, toward one of the great ziggurats of the mountains that slept in the air, towards which he was drawn, fiercely, by some certainty within him. As if the same intelligence that spoke to him also spoke to Aelwyn. In fact, surely it did. She too was sailing through trees toward the edge of the forest, toward him, toward the sleeping mountains, and toward the moon. Totally determined and totally sure, she used her thoughts to part float and part fly through the boulevards of trees, and even they fed themselves with the excess of their quiddity. And then they were together, climbing the great peak of the ziggurat, or rather sailing up it on a wave of some kind of fate, and inside, swallowed by dark, they looked no less certain, no more frightened, and a door gave way for Eluin, and a hall, and a wall, and there she was, somewhere between the earth and the stars, somewhere between round town and the forest, somewhere between him and her, in a room in which the moon sat, waiting to be drunk. The moon was reflecting up to the water of the chalice. Yes, up for up and down were not as they seemed, and in this place round was straight, and she grasped the chalice, drinking the moon full, full, drawing it up from its captive forest floor, one gulp at a time, and then she had it, trapped by a silver net, and then trapped in a silver cage, her eyes sure, and her heart open, she walked through thoughts that couldn't hold her, shining and weightless, the star catcher, the moon maker. I have it, she cried. I knew you would, he said, ecstatic, as the two were spirited back to round town.